a good father, a loving husband, a friendly neighbor, and a devoted churchgoer. That is exactly how Dennis Raiders' family and friends would have described him, before finding out the terrifying truth. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we look into the case of Dennis Raider, also known as the BTK Killer. We have covered a number of stomach-churning killers during our time on YouTube, and Dennis Raider is up there with the worst. I don't want to give you any spoilers to what you will learn about in this video, but the nickname BTK Killer originates from his self-proclaimed MO, bind, torture, and kill. Dennis Rader was born on March 9, 1945, and was the oldest of four brothers. Growing up in Wichita, Kansas, Rader had a very average childhood, although he did admit that he'd strangled cats and dogs just for fun whilst being very young. As a teenager, he became obsessed with local girls and began spying on them through bedroom windows. Rader even stole women's underwear off washing lines or wherever else he could get them. At the age of 21, Raider joined the U.S. Air Force, where he spent the next four years working as a mechanic, including long periods being stationed overseas. When he returned to Wichita, he married Paula Dietz, with whom he had two children with, a boy named Brian and a girl called Carrie. To take care of his family during the early 70s, Raider took a job on an assembly line at the Coleman Company in Wichita. Although this may sound like an average white picket fence American life, things were about to take a gruesome turn when Raider met another employee at Coleman, a 33-year-old mother of five named Julie Otero. Raider became obsessed with Julie Otero and began stalking her and would even spy on her family. If that wasn't sick enough, Raider became infatuated with Oturo's 11-year-old daughter, Josephine. After weeks of quietly watching, his urge to get closer to the family got too much, and on the morning of January 15, 1974, he forced his way inside their family home. Upon entering, he was surprised to see Julie's husband, Joseph, and their 9-year-old son, Joseph Jr., were also home. Raider, who had armed himself with a gun, held the family at gunpoint and proceeded to tie them up and strangle them to death, one by one. After killing Julie and Joseph, Raider strangled their son. Finally, he took Josephine down to the basement of the house and pulled down her pants and underwear before hanging her. After the poor girl took her last breath, the monster pleasured himself before leaving the scene with Joseph's wristwatch and a radio. Two and a half months later, the man everyone considered Mr. Nice Guy felt the urge to act upon his twisted lust once again. This time his target was Catherine Bright, a 21-year-old who also worked at the Coleman plant. According to a later confession, Raider used to watch the girl going into her house and one day decided that she would become one of his projects or PJs as he liked to call them. On April 4th, 1974, Raider broke into Catherine's home while she was out and calmly waited for her to return. She did eventually come home, but once again, to the surprise of Raider, the woman wasn't alone, returning with her brother, Kevin. While holding a gun at the pair, the killer got the two victims to tie each other up. Not the type of people who would go down without a fight. The siblings tried to fight back, but Kevin was shot in the process. Miraculously, the scuffle allowed Kevin to escape and survive the ordeal. Catherine, however, wasn't so lucky and was stabbed 11 times in the torso and back while trying with all her might to fight back against this creep. Although detectives later described the woman as fighting like a hellcat, she lost her life that night. In October 1974, Don Granger, who worked at the Wichita Eagle newspaper, received a strange phone call telling him there was a letter 
hidden inside a mechanical engineering textbook at the Wichita Public Library that he would be interested in. On investigation, the poorly written note was discovered, which described the Arturo killings in great detail. Raider wrote, When this monster enter my brain, I will never know, but it's here to stay. Also writing, the code words for me will be, bind them, torture them, kill them. BTK, you see, he at it again. They will be on the next victim. He eventually signed the note off with, yours truly guiltily. The newspaper gave the letter to the Wichita Police Department, who kept it secret for months as to not scare the public or give the writer the satisfaction. Kathy Hankel, a reporter for the rival Wichita Sun newspaper, later received a copy of the letter from an unnamed source and decided to make it public, writing an article stating that there was a serial killer on the loose. In a streak of irony, at the same time the public were all fearing that a serial killer was nearby, Raider had landed himself a job installing alarm systems with the ADT Security Service. To make things worse, the only reason Raider got a job in the first place was because people were panicking that there was a killer breaking into houses and that they wanted to be protected. For several years, Raider went silent, somehow managing to suppress his urges. That was until 1977, when he struck twice. On March 17, 1977, he broke into the home of Shirley Viam. He overpowered her, tied her up, put a plastic bag over her head, and then strangled her to death with a rope. Her three young children were at home at the time, and out of sheer terror, had locked themselves in the bathroom. Raider later admitted that he wanted to kill them next, but after Vianne's phone began ringing, he got scared and left the house. Just think about how traumatizing this event would have been for those poor children. On December 8, 1977, the BTK killer broke into the apartment of 25-year-old Nancy Fox. He cut her phone lines, made sure she wasn't home, and waited for her to return from work. After confronting her, he handcuffed her and strangled her with a belt. Once he knew she was dead, he once again pleasured himself before stealing Nancy's driver's license as a sick memento. After the infamy he had gotten from the note published in the newspaper, Raider began enjoying the brazen admission of his crimes even ringing the police to report the murder from a payphone. In February 1978, he sent a two-page letter to the Kate TV, sharing the gruesome details of the Shirley Vine and Nancy Fox murders. After this, Dennis Rader wouldn't kill again for seven long years. During that time, he kept himself busy, earning a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Wichita State University. Yep, this sick serial killer studied law and got a degree. During this time, Raider became an active member of Wichita's Christ Lutheran Church and even became president of the Congregation's Council. Carrie Rawson, Raider's daughter, described him as a great father, even finding time to be a scout leader at his son's Boy Scout group. At this point in his life, he was respected by his friends, neighbors, and family. But something was missing, something that he just couldn't shake, the need to kill. Only this time, his apple pie church-going life and his perverted urges were about to clash in the most disturbing way. Dennis Rader restarted his evil ways on April 27, 1985, when he began obsessing over an older woman, Maureen Hedge, who lived on the same street as the Rader family. In his usual style, he broke into Maureen's home and hid until she returned home with her boyfriend. This time, however, he waited for the boyfriend to leave and for Maureen to get tucked up into bed before he lunged from the darkness and strangled her to death with his bare hands. Unsatisfied with just taking the life of the woman, 
He then carried her naked body to the Christ Lutheran Church, where he posed her in a number of bondage positions around the church and took photographs. Absolutely horrifying. After he was done, he dug a shallow ditch and rolled the body inside of it before burying the body. They say that old dogs can't learn new tricks, but in September 1986, Raider changed up his whole methodology and dressed up as a telephone repairman to knock on the door of his next victim, Vicki Weagerly. As soon as she let him into the home, he aimed his gun at her. With Vicky's two-year-old son also in the house, the woman fought back when Raider tried to tie her up. Sadly, the monster overpowered her and managed to choke her with a pair of nylon stockings. He then took photographs of her body before driving away with her car. As he did drive away, Bill Wergler, Vicky's husband, was returning home on the opposite side of the road and locked eyes with the stranger driving his wife's car. However, this wouldn't save the tenth and final victim of the BTK killer who was 62-year-old Dolores E. Davis. Raider was actually on a Boy Scout camping trip on January 19, 1991, when he realized he had forgotten something at home. En route to his home, however, this vile killer took a detour and broke into the elderly woman's home by throwing a concrete block through the window. He tied her up and strangled her to death with a pair of pantyhose before hiding the body under a bridge and returning to the campsite like nothing had happened. Whether he felt like his luck would run out or that he was getting too old to keep killing, Raider decided that his killing spree must come to an end. By 2004, the investigation of the BTK killer had gone ice cold. That is when Raider foolishly tried to send a letter to the police, claiming responsibility for a killing that hadn't been previously linked to him. This ignited interest in the case once again and led the police to taking DNA tests from hundreds of men in an attempt to track down the BTK killer. In fact, despite 1,100 DNA samples being taken overall, they failed to identify Dennis Rader. Rader eventually sent the police a message on a floppy disk, who quickly checked the metadata of the Microsoft Word document. In this data, they found that the document had been made by a man who called himself Dennis. They also found mention of the Lutheran Church. From that moment, it was down to a simple Google search of Lutheran Church Wichita Dennis, which gave the result of a man named Dennis Rader, the president of the Congregations Council. At this point, the police already knew that the BTK killer drove a black Jeep Cherokee, the very same type of car parked outside the house of Dennis Rader. Now, you may think that that's the end of our story, but things weren't that simple. Even though the police suspected Rader, they only had strong circumstantial evidence and needed more direct evidence to lock him up. The way they solved this was by controversially obtaining a warrant to test the DNA of a pap smear from Raider's daughter that had been taken at the University of Kansas's medical clinic when she was a student there. The DNA of the pap smear was a near match to the DNA found under one of the victim's fingernails. This was finally the evidence they needed to arrest a serial killer who had evaded the law for 30 long years. After being questioned, Dennis confessed to being the BTK killer, sharing every gruesome detail of the killings. He even gave detectives the locations of his hidey holes, where he stashed his mementos. Among the things found were photographs of Raider dressed up in the clothing of his victims posing in bondage positions. Investigators believe that he did this to relive the ecstasy of the murders and to put himself in the mindset of his victims. On June 27, 2005, Dennis Rader pleaded guilty to 10 counts of first degree murder and received the maximum sentence of 10 consecutive life terms. He is currently locked up at the maximum security El Dorado Correctional Facility near Wichita 
where he is being held in solitary confinement for his own safety. The man who thought it was his right to enter any home he pleased to take the lives of innocent people is now only allowed out of his 80 square foot cell for one hour, five times a week. It makes me wonder if Raider would have gotten away with brutally killing his 10 victims if he didn't feel the need to satisfy his own ego by sending letters and hints of his crimes. It is likely he would have carried on being the good husband, the good father, the devoted churchgoer, but above all that, at the very core of his being, he would have continued to be the embodiment of evil, prepared to scratch that perverted itch at any given moment. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Dennis Rader. So why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.